for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, I pray now in the next few minutes that you'll take our hearts and let us, Father, just move into those pastures for a moment. Let us sense, Father, the shepherd as he watches over us. Let us understand the importance of us being the sheep and that we follow his leadership. We're guided by him. We're protected by him. We're fed by him. We're, we're guarded and guided by him. Father, we thank you so much for our shepherd. And now, Father, as we go into this time of study, we go into this time of preaching, may our hearts be tender to what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The verse, thou preparest a table before me in the cups, uh, in the presence of mine enemies, uh, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Uh, I don't remember just what we were involved in. We were at a, uh, we were having something in the fellowship hall, and Joni Bailey was standing there, and she quoted that verse, and she said, you know, it's important to know who's at your table. Who have you invited to your table? And boy, as she said that, it just hit me right between the eyes. And that was, that was the start of me thinking about preaching through Psalm 23. And now we come to that passage, and I'm excited to that. Let me give you two pictures, uh, word pictures to help describe what we're looking at. First of all, I want you to consider it from the sheep's point of view, if you would. First, the shepherd puts us, his sheep, in a place to feed. It's well watered. It's, it's, a, it's a green pasture. It has everything that we need. And even though around us are all the bears and wolves and lions, we don't have to be afraid because the shepherd is there. And he just kind of watches over us. And while he's t watching over us and while we're peacefully grazing, even though these animals are around us, he carefully goes from sheep to sheep to sheep to find if they have any needs. And he provides for their needs. He, he patches their wounds. He, 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 he takes care of their, the pesticide that they need to get rid of the pests that bother these sheep. And I'll explain that in a minute. But that's the picture we have from Psalm 23. But I want you to go to another word picture. I want you to imagine, if you will, your shepherd, Jesus Christ. I want you to imagine this morning that he comes to you and he says, Come, I want you to sit with me. And he brings you into a banquet room all by yourself, nobody else. This isn't, this isn't about the church. This is about you and your shepherd. And you look in front of you and he's prepared this beautiful table, a white tablecloth that's pressed, not a wrinkle in it, beautiful centerpiece and full of all kinds of food. And he said, I want you to sit and eat with me. I have a special time for just me and you. And I want it to be special. I'm not inviting your enemies. Although they are, uh, they are present, they're not invited. This is just for you and your shepherd. As you think about that, let's step off into this and take a look at this prepared table. This is the shepherd's care for you. The description of him preparing a table before you is his provision, how he provides for you. The fact that he does it in the presence of the enemy, it speaks of his protection. And he protects us from these. Even though they're prevalent, they have no access to us as long as he's present. This is his care for you. And as we consider this idea, I want you to think about this. His desire is that he wants to communion you, with you. He wants to have a fellowship with you. He wants to, he, he, this is so special. When my, when my daughters were 16, one of the things I did, I, uh, I took them out for a special meal with dad. Just me and the girl, that's all. Me and my daughter. I have two daughters. It was their 16th birthday. And um, I told them, I said, I want you to dress up. This is special. This is just for you. I'm doing this just for you. I went and rented a nice car. And I came and I picked them up and I had on my suit. And I ushered them out to the car and opened the door and they got in. I said, this is just for you. 
And I took them to, I took Jamie to a steak and ale. Remember steak and ale? And we sat down, and I mean just a little table just for the two of us. And there we sat, and we visited, and we talked, and I had some things I wanted to share with you, with her. And I had a, a, a celibacy ring I wanted to give her, and I, I just made it so special. It was just for her. Because I wanted that fellowship. I wanted that to be so special for her. Because it was special to me. She was special to me. I want you to think that's the way this is with this. God desires for you to have a relationship with Him. He loves you so much. And His only desire, the only thing He thinks about is you. And He wants to have this wonderful relationship with you. So He prepares this table. You don't do it. It's not about you preparing anything. It's not about you bringing anything. It's about Him preparing it for you. He prepares it. He initiates this event. He's the one that comes up with the idea. It's all about you because He loves you. And brings it to you. And He sets it before you. You didn't ask for this. This is a divine appointment. You can't even prepare for this. It's done completely by the Lord, your shepherd. The Creator God wants to serve you. Can you get that in your head? The omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God Creator of the universe wants to have a, a meal, a relationship with you, period, you. See, so many times we put ourselves in the group. I don't want you to this morning. I want you to single yourself out. He wants to have that relationship with you, period. That's how much he loves you. And he's prepared this just for you. Now, I'll be honest with you, I can't understand it. I'm like David. He said, it's just too wonderful for me to even consider that my God would want to love me. This wonderful shepherd wants to have a relationship with this old, this old rotten, smelly sheep. I can't imagine why he'd want to do that. But he does. He desires to. That's where we get the word grace. Amen. He graces us with his love. He says, I'll give you my love even though you don't deserve it. I'll give it to you because I want you to have it. Now let's go a step further. Let's consider the table. He sits down and he puts it in the presence of our enemies. They're all around us. I see the, the enemy I have over here, the enemy that besets me all the time comes maybe unforgiveness or bitterness and it sits over here and I have an enemy over here that sometimes comes and tells me I can't do anything unless I have it in my life maybe some kind of addiction I, I look over there and sitting there in that spot over there is another uh, of the enemy that comes and tries to defeat me all the time and the Lord sets me in the middle of all these enemies and the reason he does that because he wants us to know that you're safe when he's present, he, you're safe. The enemy can't touch you. You see, if old, old smutty face decides to show up and thinks he's going to sit at the table, your shepherd will pull that rod out we talked about last week, and he'll just bop him on the head and say, you get back over yonder. I didn't invite you to this table. And guess what? He'll have to obey because he's God. Amen? Amen. If you've been reading through Isaiah with me and, and my, my devotions in the morning, I tell you what a wonderful study we've had in Isaiah. So many times God says, I am God, I'm God alone. I have no need for any other gods. I am the only God you need. He said over and over and over he said that. And that's true of us. He's our shepherd. We need no other. He'll provide for us. In the middle of our enemies, he'll take care of us. There are those that wish to have us for lunch. But God provides protection for us. So these enemies are present, but they're not invited to the table. How then can these enemies interfere with our relationship with God? If God has prepared the table just for us, and God is bigger than our enemies and can protect us, from, how in the world do they get invited to our table? Well, I'll tell you, it's one word. Me. I invite them. You invite them. God says, come sit at the table. I've prepared it just for you. And you come and you sit. And all of a sudden you start shaking because now you've got to be all alone with God. And you know He sees through all your junk. He knows you. And so all of a sudden you say, I, I'm a little uncomfortable. I think I need, I need, I need that, uh, 
that friend of mine over there, come here, you. And he sits there. You sit here because I need you. I, I'm afraid maybe God's going to ask me to give you up. That unforgiving spirit. You know, I deserve to be mad at those people. They did me wrong. I deserve to be mad at them. Come sit here because I, I'm afraid he's going to ask me to give that up. You, you, you come here. I, I need you because if I don't have you... Listen, you know how important you are to me because anytime I get in trouble, I'm pulling you out of the cabinet and pouring me a drink, so you sit right here. I need to make sure you're right here with me. Whatever it is, and we allow these things, we invite them to come to the table. And can I tell you something? Listen to me. Every time you invite these to the table, you push Jesus away. You're saying, I don't really want that relationship with you. I've got a relationship. I don't need your relationship like you think I do. But you do. Here we are in the presence of these enemies. Who are these enemies? I've mentioned several, but let's talk about one in particular that most of you probably already thought of. Think of old Satan, old smutty face. He's our enemy, isn't he? John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, if that's not an enemy... The problem with that is there's a little bit more to that verse than just that. Amen? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Amen. Oh, Satan can stand off the side talking about what he's going to do or what he has done. But Jesus doesn't say, you don't even have to listen to them. I've already defeated that booger. I've already, I've already won that victory for you. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom may devour. He's ready to eat you up. Problem is, he can't do it. Because the Lord Jesus has already defeated him. Remember last week we talked about Hebrews 2, 14 through 15, where Jesus, it says about Jesus that he came in human form. And also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them from who, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So you see, Jesus already defeated Satan. People walk around so afraid of, of Satan all the time. I think you ought to be aware of him, but you don't have to be afraid of him. He's just an old fallen angel. He can't do anything unless you let him do it. Because Jesus Christ already defeated him. Amen. He's already been hung on the cross. Jesus died on the cross to defeat him. Rose from the grave. See, he had victory over death. Oh, 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 Satan, he's the one that brings us. He brings the wage of sin is death. He's the one that we, if we are going to be afraid of death, he would be the one. But there's no reason to be afraid of death anymore. Why? Because Jesus already defeated that. The stone was rolled away. Amen. And he came out. So I'm not afraid of him. Satan can, can dare me. Satan can stand off to the side while I'm having communion with the Lord. And he can say, you know you're going to die someday. And I go, I sure am. And I'm going to be with Jesus the rest of my life. Amen. Go on. Talk to me. Amen. You don't have any power over that. Right, right. You don't have any power over me. I sit at the table with my shepherd. And there is no fear with him. But let me talk to you about somebody that's really a worse enemy than the Satan. And it begins with an S too, and that's self. You see, Satan is an enemy, yeah, but he's not near the enemy who self is. Amen. 1 John 2, 16, it says, For all, those, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, that's self, the lust of the eye, that's self, and the pride of life, that's self. These are the things of the world. These are our enemies. These are the things that we, we have that come against us. Self. Self says, I want to do what I want to do. I don't want to do what God wants. I don't care what God wants. Now, you may not say that because that sounds really kind of bad. It sounds more like this. I want to do what I want to do. I, I'm just not going to, I'm not too concerned about what God wants right now. It happens a lot. Sunday mornings, it happens a lot. Other times during our lives, it happens a lot. It doesn't matter what God wants. I, I, want, I want what I want. When you say that, that's self. And you're in trouble. Because you've invited self to the table that God's prepared and God's not going to show up if self shows up. Let's talk about some enemies that we've, we, we shouldn't be inviting to the table. I think of three passages. I get ellipses for you. I'm going to walk quickly through them. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. But listen to this. 
In Proverbs 6, 9, 16 through 9 says, These six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination to him. So here's seven things that are enemies that we need to be careful of. A proud look. Arrogancy. I, I have an ego. I, I'm going to just con- go and confess it because if I don't do it now, I'll have to do it in a minute. So I've got an ego. I've got this thing inside me. Now, maybe you don't have that. I'm sure you probably don't. You're a wonderful Christian. You probably don't have any trouble with this. But I do. Ego. I like it when my ego is stroked. You, you women know about that, don't you? You, know, when you? you tell your husband, you say, you're the best husband in the world. Doesn't he go, I know. Right? That's what I do. I know. I love that ego being stroked. I love that pride thing, you know? That I'm the best there ever has been. I'm the best husband. I'm the best father. I'm the best preacher. I'm the best whatever. And all of a sudden, my ego gets so big. Guess what? My ego shows up at the table, but Jesus doesn't. I'd rather have suffer with Jesus, amen, amen, than a bloated ego. A lying tongue. Oh, it wasn't a really lie. It was just a little fib. It, it, it didn't hurt anybody, did it? I don't know. God says the lying tongue's abomination to him. Did you invite your lying tongue to the table? Hands that shed innocent blood. Wanting to hurt somebody that's innocent. Wanting to bully somebody. Wanting to be mean to somebody. It really didn't do anything wrong. A false witness. No, a heart that devises wicked imagination. Boy, I tell you what, nowadays you don't have to have a whole lot of imagination anymore. It's all out there for us to see. Amen. But everywhere we go, it's around us. Doesn't take much for our old brains to go where it shouldn't go. And we invite that to the table. Feet that are swift to run to mischief. A false witness that bears, that speaks lies. And he that soweth discord among his brethren. You know, that last one, I think we ought to, we ought to put a sign above the door. If you're coming to sow discord among the brethren, turn around and go home. Amen? I mean, really, I mean, like God doesn't honor that. But it seems like churches are full of people that want to sow discord. Did you hear about so-and-so? A little bit of gossip? Sowing discord among the brethren. I don't like the way that guy acts. Sowing discord among the brethren. I don't appreciate sowing discord among the brethren. You invite that, that attitude to the table, and I'm going to tell you something. Jesus isn't going to show up. Let's go on. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 are the list of the works of the flesh. Just real quickly. It says adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. These are sexual sins. These, are, these have to do with our just sexual sins. I'm not going to deal with all of it. I just say this. that Most of it is for, uh, fornication comes from the word pornea. Guess what word we get from that? Pornography. Come on, pornography, you sit at the table because you give me all the joy I need. Jesus says, fine, you don't need me. There's another word that's used. It's called, uh, uh, we get the word pharmacy, pharmakeia, and it means drugs. Come on, addiction, sit at the table with me, whatever it might be. Because I can count on you. When I've got, when I'm stressed, boy, I can get a glass of you or I can pop a pill of you and I've got, everything's okay. I don't need Jesus. I got you. Well, guess what? Jesus won't be showing up at the table. <clears throat> Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath. These have to do with our worship. Spiritual, idolatry. Anything you put ahead of God, anything. Jesus says, come to the table. I don't have time. Your time has just become an idol. I can't. I've got other things planned for the day. But I've planned this for us. I know God and I know you're important and all that, but this is really important to me. These are things that become idols. Envying, murder, drunkenness, raveling of such like he says... I've told you in time past, and they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These personal things. I just say anything that stands in the way of my relationship with God, anything that I would invite to the table that would in any way hinder this relationship is not invited. God did not invite them. I have to invite them. James 3, I just had to throw this in because he speaks of worldly wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife, envying and strife, 
I, you know what? I think most everybody has that in their lives, some way or another. You know, bitterness, angry about something. It can be something really small, or it can be something really big. But we walk around with this bitterness towards either that thing or whatever it was that caused it or the person that brought it into our life. And we carry it and carry it and carry it. All of a sudden it becomes a part of us. And Jesus said, come sit at the table and we've got to pull up an extra chair because we can't get away from it. Well, let's move on. Y'all have gotten quiet. <laughs> you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Oh, but he says, I anoint the head with oil. Now, I got to think about shepherds and sheep, and I'm thinking about a bunch of sheep walking around out there with oily heads. Or, gee, I, can you picture this? And I'm going, this does not look good. This doesn't, I don't know that this looks good. I, evidently, I don't quite understand all of this. And so I did a little research from shepherds, and what happens is that flies are a nuisance to, to sheep, flies. When you think about it, that's probably true. Sheep have little legs that they can't do like that. And they've got this little bitty tail that will never swish away a fly, right? A horse has that big old tail, and he'll sh he's standing there, and he just swats flies. But they can't do that. And so these flies are a nuisance to these animals. And so what the shepherd would do is he would take, and he would mix up oil with sulfur, and he would pour it over the heads of the animals, and it acted like an insecticide to keep those flies from, from burrowing into their skin or... Like most of them, they said it gets up in their nose and lays their larvae up in their nose. Now, think about that. They said that when those larvae begin to hatch, the sheep go crazy. You'll see them beating their heads against the fence, trying to get rid of those flies. So the Lord comes, the shepherd comes, and he anoints them with oil to try to get rid of those nuisances, those little pests. And I think it speaks of all those little irritants in our lives that seem so small, but they drive us nuts. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? I drop something on the floor, that drives me crazy. Because I know i got to pick it up. Right? What was I thinking? Why didn't I hang on to that? What's wrong with now? I've got to bend over and pick that up. It's a long ways to that floor now. Not near as short as it used to be. Little things. Stub your toe as you're walking through the midnight trying to go to the restroom. Little annoyances that just drive you crazy. You know he's concerned about those things too? He's our shepherd. So the shepherd uses the oil as a salve too. As, as Also as he goes around to the sheep and he looks to see if they have any cuts or any sores. And he'll use the oil to, uh, to medicate those areas. David basically saying that the Lord, is, the, the Lord is his shepherd. And as our good shepherd not only protects us, he also soothes our hurts and heals our wounds in life. Now for us that are Christians, oil is a representation of the Holy Spirit. Now think about this for a minute. Let's go to the other side. He's invited me to the table. Now he's going to anoint my head with oil. That means he's going to anoint me with the Holy Spirit of God. Woo! Hang on, are you ready for this? I'm going to sit down at the table. My enemies are all around me, but they can't come because they haven't been invited, and I'm not going to invite them. I'm having a special time with the Lord. The Lord says, now then, I'm going to anoint your head with oil. And he anoints us with the Holy Spirit. He puts his Holy Spirit in us and on us. He indwells us with his Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And then that's for our salvation. And then he infills us. He fills us with his Holy Spirit for daily living. He takes care of everything. There's nothing that he hasn't taken care of. I, like David, have to say at that, my cup runs over. Amen. My cup just runs over. Yeah. Is this a response to all that God has done for you, that your cup runs over? Or are you one of those that says, I wish he had done just a little bit more, right? I, I get blessed every so often by the Lord. The Lord will send me something, uh, uh, sometimes a monetary gift I, that I wasn't expecting, and I get it, and I, I get the check, and I pop it open. And I say, man, look at what God sent, Ruby, look. Man, if it was just a little bit more, I could pay that. Boy, thank you, Lord. Spit in your face because you didn't give me enough. He always gives me more than I deserve. When we stop consider just the blessings from this psalm, it's more than we deserve. Listen to this. and I'm just going to walk through the psalm. Just listen. 
The omnipotent, that's all-powerful. Omniscient, that's the all-knowing. The omnipresent, he's everywhere all the time. The eternal creator God is my shepherd. My cup runs over. Amen? Amen? Because he is who he is. I have need of nothing. My cup runs over. In his sovereignty, the fact that he's always in control, he makes me lie down in the green pastures. He provides me with the necessities of life. My, my cup runs over. I'm blessed. In his, in his grace, he leads me beside the still waters. He provides calm and assurance of whose I am, who I belong to. I'm his. My cup runs over. In his patience, he restores all that's broken and needs to be replaced in my life. In his perfection, he leads me in his paths of righteousness living and has put his name on me, declaring that I am his and his alone. My cup runs over. In life, he removes all the fears as I'm reminded of his protection from evil and his direction and guidance through the obstacles of life. My cup runs over. He desires to commune with me and to keep my enemies at bay with his divine power. He's not only anointed me with his loving spirit, he has given me his spirit to indwell and fill me. My cup runs over. I don't need to read anything else. That's it. I mean, that, that just well does it. I mean, what else could there be? Does your cup run over? Let me ask you. With all of that, isn't your cup overflowing? I mean, when you say it's overflow, if it's not, can I tell you why it's not? Because you keep bringing junk to the table, amen? If you'd leave the junk out, if you'd leave your enemies to the side, if you'd say, I don't need all that stuff in my life, all I need is Jesus, I promise you, He's more than you'll ever need. Amen. Your cup will overflow. Amen. You... you <laughs> You should be so full of all that God's given you that it just kind of gushes out all over everybody around you, everywhere you go. Everybody ought to see it. I mean, when you're in the store, they ought to see it. You know, when you pick up that bottle of syrup and it's 10 cents cheaper than it was last week, and you go, thank you, Lord Jesus, thank you. And somebody's there behind you going, why are you thanking Jesus? Don't you think you ought to uh, ask, uh, thank somebody up in government? No. I think I'll put my trust in Jesus. Amen. <laughs> it, it ought to be whatever they pull up beside you on the side of the road and you're changing a tire and they hear you singing victory in Jesus. They go, why are you so happy? Because I got a flat tire. <laughs> Isn't it great? <laughs> Isn't God good? And they roll the windows up and drive off. It's okay, but you overflowed on them, amen? Why can't we be like that? We're church people. See, we leave church and we go out here and somebody cuts us off as we're leaving the church parking lot. Run them down and give them a cussing. In Jesus' name, amen? What's wrong with us? We ought to be overflowing with all that God's done for us. But the only problem, I'm telling you, if you're not one of those type of Christians, one of those type of people, look and see who you're inviting to your table. Because that establishes that right there. Because if you found that Jesus is all you need and the enemy has to stay away, you will be rejoicing all the time Amen. in everything. Let's bow. Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word and how strong and powerful it is. And thank you, Lord, that today, Mother's Day, what a day for us to rejoice in the blessing of our moms, those who've given life to our children, to us. But Lord, you're the one that gives life, eternal life, to those who believe on you. Father, I pray if there's someone here that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, if they've never come into that relationship, if they've never seen you prepare the table before them, I pray today, Lord, they'll come and say, I want a shepherd like that. I want to know a God like that. I want a relationship with the Creator like that. Let them come and receive you as their Lord and Savior. But Father, the majority of us in this room, we know you that way. 
But we would say if we look at our table, we've got too many chairs pulled up. We've been inviting the wrong people to sit with us. And now, Father, today, we recognize the people and the things we put in place of having a relationship with you. And we want to confess it. We want to make it right. We want this table to be open for only you and me. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. In the next few minutes, we're going to give an invitation. If God speaks to your heart, if you'd like for me to pray with you, I'll be here at the front. I'll be glad to pray with you. Or maybe you'd like to use the altars here, these old steps. You can come and kneel and pray. And, or maybe right where you're at, just you and God, just, just confess and get it right with Him and say, Lord, no more. I don't want my enemies at my table any longer. I want you and you only. That's all I want. That's all I need. And put your faith and trust back in Him. If God's directing you to make a decision for the church and you come, but if you're lost, you don't know Christ your Savior, would you come and just say, Preacher, would you take the time and show me how I can be saved? Show me how I can know for sure that if I were to die, I'd go to heaven. I will spend all afternoon with you if I need to. I'll answer every question you have if you'll give me a chance. But you've got to come.